that are um, cited uh, irregular in the second person of Asia. Charles Mickelson Amelin. He is he has such an impressive job title that I feel it's almost easier to say what he doesn't do. Uh, because he's a bibliographer at Memorial Library for Scandinavian Humanities, Classics, and Jewish and South Asian Studies. I haven't been able to turn that into a snazzy acronym, but we're working on it. <laughs> uh, in addition, he's also a visiting lecturer in Scandinavian Studies. He has an MA in Scandinavian Philology and an MA in Library of Information Studies, and he successfully defended his PhD last year in Scandinavian Philology of Disability in Saga Literature. His interests are linguistics, etymology, lexicography, cultural linguistics, linguistic patterns, lingu linguistic exchanges and hybrids, disability studies, and studying receptions of the underrepresented in the world. And so that's also a very comprehensive list. Uh, and today I won't say very much, but uh, Todd is going to be talking, uh, giving an overview of the library collections. Uh, he'll also talk about some current collaborative efforts to continue the excellence in collections in Madison as well as throughout the nation and the world. As you may know, library, libraries are under some attack, uh, currently uh, financially and otherwise, because they do this thing called knowledge, and that's the problem. Um, uh, so although this talk is geared towards students and those less familiar with the current collections, Todd will also be talking about new databases, projects, and research strategies. And one of the many amazing, wonderful things about Todd, he's super accessible, so if you have any questions at all, email him, and he loves to talk about the library and his work. And everything else, right? Okay, please join me welcoming him. Thank you. So, um, yeah, today, I, first of all, I want to say that this is going to be very informal. I would like you to ask questions if you have them. You don't need to um, worry about interrupting if I say something and you want to know more about it. If I'm able to answer, I'm glad. Uh, to help you at any point or point things out to you. Um, but I'm going to start a little bit with the history. I've done this before, and part I decided to leave a lot of things in because with the changing of students, it's rather important for you to understand the history um, of South Asia and our, our library collections, um, and then understand things that we face, and then how we're trying to make information accessible throughout the world if not just at the university, if not just in the nation. Um, so, um, the history of South Asia in Madison, Sanskrit was taught for the first time in the 1880s, so it goes way back. Indian classics were taught uh, via comparative literature in the 1900s. Um, the Department of Indian Studies was founded in 1958. The first National Defense Education Act grant was awarded in 1960. This has turned into what we have as Title VI now. Um, the focus on his interdisciplinarity was really strong from the beginning here. So it wasn't just let's learn Hindi, let's learn Urdu, let's learn Bangla, or even let's study the, the Pali and Sanskrit, but rather let's look at how things are interrelated. Um, we've had exchange programs. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. No. Just, well, can you define what Sanskrit is for? Okay, sure. So Sanskrit is a mother language. Um, it is the language of Hinduism per se. Um, ideally, that is the case. So um, all language is living. It, and that's why I say an ideal, because language changes constantly. The way that you speak is different from the way your parents speak. But it is uh, a language from point X to point Y. I'm not an expert on this. This is why I'm using those terms. If you want, you can look it up um, in a reference to see these specific dates. But um, it is um, much akin to before uh, Vatican II, Latin was used in the Catholic Church, for example. Um, so it is a language that stays the same, even though it somewhat changes also throughout time. So if you look at Hindi, if you look at Bangla, if you look at any of the Indo-European languages, they can, and Indo-European subcontinental languages, they can draw their history back to, uh, to Sanskrit. And Pali is on the way back. So Pali is one of the languages between modern and, and Sanskrit. 
Yeah, no problem. And the same thing happened with the Dravidian languages. It's just a little bit different. And Dravidian languages were uh, also influenced by Sanskrit through Hinduism. Um, okay, so uh, we've had exchange programs, uh, especially in agriculture, religious studies, and also language. So learning language um, throughout India. The library in 1972 um, had 43,000 items in original languages pertaining to South Asia, not just in total. 24,000 of um, them were English translations, or yes, 3,100 periodicals, 25 newspapers in 11 Indian languages. The areas of concentration, um, South Asian Buddhism in Tibetan, Sanskrit, and Pali. Um, that's another language family with Tibetan. Um, modern South Asian languages, South India collection from the early 18th century to the present with a very unique collection of Madras presidency documents, um, Sasli languages as well as Flas. So we do, even though some languages aren't currently being taught in the regular semester time, I do actually purchase items so that people who come here in the summer can actually utilize our collections and, and look at works in the languages that they're studying. And then we have digital collections and databases, and I'll show you that a little bit later on. <coughs> so my background is a little bit weird. Why? Yes. Can you make the screen brighter at all and speak a little bit louder? Of course. <coughs> First of all, let me move this down <coughs> here. This is on, right? I don't think it is. Oh, okay. Um, I, I, I was I, thinking it was on, and so I was kind of oh, being quiet because I didn't want to do that. We never use it. No, it's okay. It's not that big. I don't know how to these lights open. Yeah. Yeah. make the screen brighter. Um, that, that helps, presumably. A little bit. Yeah, thank you. Okay, yeah, and if people want to open the, the window shades, a tiny bit more. so that people can see, that's fine. Um, I will also make this. Um, this PowerPoint available, as I said, on the web page. You can just write me and I'll send you the outline version of it. Okay, so can everybody hear me now? Yes. Better? Okay. So me, my background. I'm a little bit odd. Um, so I have a BA in German from Arizona State University with a certificate in Scandinavian Studies. I started off as a Germanist, a linguist. I have an MA in Library and Information Studies from here. I also have an MA in Scandinavian philology, specializing in Norwegian language policy and historical linguistics. And then I have a PhD in Scandinavian philology from uh, UW-Madison as well. And I specialize in cultural linguistics, writing on disability and saga literature. So why South Asia? Well, <laughs> um, I was hired as a librarian, and my predecessor, um, as a librarian, there was a graduate student, Sandeep Kindo, an interim, but my, uh, the, the person who was the librarian for, Scan uh, for South Asia, uh, Mary Rader, had left, and they needed to find somebody who was permanent in the area, and I have had an interest in uh, South Asia for many reasons. Um, one of the reasons is that uh, Urdu is one of the uh, main immigrant languages in Norway. And as I said, I wrote on language policy in Norway. And so how South Asians are able to continue using their vernacular language in Norway has interest, interested me. So because they couldn't hire somebody new, because they didn't have the funds for it, I raised my hand and I'm very happy to be here. Um, but enough about me. So we're talking about South Asia, um, and what my area is, is not necessarily what is considered here, or what you might consider to be South Asia. So when you look at the map, I actually do not cover Afghanistan. Um, another librarian by the name of Andy Spencer covers that. I do cover Pakistan. I cover India, Nepal, Bhutan, <coughs> Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, um, and then uh, the, the Maldives. We don't really buy much as far as that is concerned. The other thing that I'm very interested in is the, 
the way that uh, Hindi is used around the world, both in immigrant communities, but also in communities from yesteryear. <clears throat> All right. So, South Asian languages. This is very difficult for one person to be able to look at all of South Asia. We're talking about many different families. So we have the Indo-Aryan languages, we have the Iranian languages, um, which for example, if you look over here, but that also includes uh, the, uh, the Parsi community. Um, then we have Nuristani languages, then we have Dravidian languages, which are a whole different family. So that's just like, not apples and oranges, that's like apples and footballs. <laughs> and then we have the Austro-Asiatic languages, same thing. These are a lot of the uh, native peoples of India. Um, Tibeto-Burman languages, so this is more like Sino-Tibetan. And then we have unclassified language isolate up here, and I have no idea what that actually is. So anyway, how do I do it? Well, I work with the Library of Congress. So they have specialists actually embedded in Delhi. Um, originally, there was one in Islamabad, which covered everything from Pakistan uh, to the west, and then one in New Delhi, which covered everything to the east of South Asia, but because of safety issues, they've moved both the offices to New Delhi, although they cover their own areas. It's not one office. All right, so the Library of Congress Overseas Office, and that should be oversee. <laughs> it can oversee whatever it wants, but um, there are five offices worldwide, so this is not something that's just specific to South Asia. There, there's the New Delhi office, which is the oldest one. Then there's the Islamabad, uh, uh, Islamabad office, then Jakarta, Cairo, Nairobi, and Rio. And so the idea was we wanted to bring information from abroad here. It's very easy to do so in Europe. It's very easy to do so in North America, so Mexico, for example. But it's not so easy the further you get away and the different cultures and languages for American universities. So we, uh, we order from the Library of Congress. I actually just sent out letters this morning to my colleagues who are going to be buying things for different libraries like law. Um, then we look at historical trends. Um, so we do have certain things that actually nobody studies here. Um, and we still continue to order them because somebody needs to have them in the US. We order for ourselves. Um, we order for experts, so we order for ourselves in the sense of if somebody comes in as teaching classes, then we order for that, those classes if it's made known. We order for our experts, so for example, you know, um, uh, if Mitra, for example, asks me for something, I'll buy it. <laughs> um, and then we have a general collection for undergraduate graduates and early uh, graduate students. I say early graduate students because you might not know this, but I'm not capable of knowing everything that you guys are working on. So this is where you guys come in, and you need to come and talk to me if there's something you don't find in the library and you'd like to see. As long as I can get it, it's sometimes very difficult, but I can try my darndest to get it for you as you write your dissertation, for example, or at, even when you're in, in your... Uh, uh, masters and writing a thesis or papers, you can come contact me. I'm glad to help you out. Okay, so <clears throat> we pay attention to current trends as well, what's going on in the field, and then we have cooperative uh, work. So there are two organizations that I belong to that are very important. Uh, SAMP is one of them, and darn it if I can't remember what it, spells, what it stands for. But it's basically a digitization project that's run through CRL, uh, Coalition <coughs> Research Libraries, which is based out of uh, Chicago. And it's actually housed semi through CRL and the University of Chicago. So we buy things together, and then we digitize them, and then it's available to everybody who subscribes to this. So it's quite expensive, but they do have a payment plan. And for the fortunate aspect, they also allow 
people who are in South Asia and not, cannot necessarily afford to pay all of the money um, to access these items, they're allowed to actually use ours. So if they join the group and they start digitizing their own collections, they can pay somebody to digitize them and they can use that as the equal of what we pay. Um, we don't have the, um, we, yeah, it's easier for me to spend the money than to actually hire somebody. So it's a little bit weird that way. But um, there is somebody actually in, uh, in Chicago who oversees the American scanning projects. And then CONSULT. CONSULT is a librarian's network for South Asians. And we meet every year twice, um, once here at the meeting and then once at the Asian Studies Association meeting. Um, and so we get together and we talk about what we're collecting. Um, and as things get more and more expensive and kind of out of reach, then we start to divide things up so that one library will focus on one thing, one library will focus on another thing, and it allows us to have kind of these consortial networks where people can order items from other places and still get it in the United States. So our major uh, collections on campus, the languages and literatures that we collect are Hindi, Urdu, Telugu, Tamil, Nepali, and Tibetan. Tibetan is kind of a questionable area here because of the politics of it. I like to think of it is, as the way that I cover everything that is uh, Tibetan exile. But then my colleague Diana Xu, who covers East Asian studies and China, she covers things that have to do with the government of the semi-autonomous region of Tibet. So we work together to ensure that both sides are covered. Okay, so then we have area studies. This is an area studies center. And as I said, interdisciplinarity before. So there's women and gender studies. Um, and we collect a lot. We collect a lot for anthropology, agricultural and life science. Uh, music, we have a great collection at the Mills Music Library in the basement of the building of uh, Memorial Library. It's a separate library. We also collect art, books on art, actually, not the pieces of art. Um, <laughs> law, we have a large law collection. Um, education, so there is representation um, for education as well. Um, and then medicine, um, both from the traditional sorts, so uh, Yunani or uh, Greek medicine, um, Ayurvedic med medicine, and then uh, medicine as kind of Western medicine worldwide. Excuse me. Yes. So if you had a subject um, <coughs> on South Asia that's more historical, political, economic, th that doesn't necessarily fall under the South Asian collection, even if it's something that perhaps is published in India or... Give me an example. The list you just gave, uh -huh. I don't... So, for instance, if I didn't, was looking for something historical or economic, political, uh -huh. which category would it fall under? These aren't, it's just many more at the bottom. Oh, I see. So these are just examples I of see things that I collect. Okay, okay, okay. Um, we, don't, we don't live in it at all. You don't have it organized in that fashion, No, we do not, and we do collect a lot of political okay, uh, okay. items. All right, gotcha. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> it might be a little confusing, yeah. So, um, just talking about local digitization projects, so we have digitization and preservation. Um, so a lot of the problems that we face with South Asian collections is that paper from India has been in the past, and although they claim it's stopped overall, um, it's kind of questionable. It's an impregnated paper, which means that they basically put uh, pesticides into the paper well, that changes the chemical compounds of the paper, and it becomes highly acidified. And so what happens is the paper starts breaking down much faster. And so we try to keep that from happening, but one of the ways that we can uh, ensure that items stay on for much longer 
is to microfilm, and then also um, sharing resources. So um, the case that I'm bringing here, the South of India Observer, there's this museum in the South of India called the Nilgiri Museum, and they were looking for the South of India Observer because there is no um, copy of it anywhere near the museum. Um, we have it, but one of the problems is it's still under copyright. So it's very difficult kind of going between law, like what is legally we're allowed to share, and then what can they have, and so it sadly did not work out in the end. Um, articles are something that we can very much share, and I do quite often, not just through ILL, but if somebody contacts me directly. But theses and dissertations, again, if it's the whole thing they're looking for, we can't help them. So we have the UW Digital Collections. There's the Gender and Women's Studies Collection, the South Asian Period Periodicals Index, the Anthropology Collection, and the South and Southeast Asia Video Archive. And we're trying to work right now in actually <coughs> renewing them so that they're a little bit more up to date. They kind of fell by the wayside in recent years. And so we want to make sure that they have all of the information from the libraries in them. All right, so they're collaborative projects. As I had mentioned before, ways that you can get items if we don't have them in our own library. So there's UW System Borrow, which unfortunately for South Asia only has a, bi a minor percent, and that's UW campuses across the state. You can borrow from any campus. So when you order, actually, you can order in from Parkside or from Stevens Point or something like that. But with something that's as specialized as South Asia, generally we're the ones who collect. You will find certain ones on other campuses, certain items, but not a whole lot of them. Then there's ILL. ILL is great. It doesn't cost you anything. But what I recommend actually is something called You Borrow. And I can show that to you in just a little uh, bit. Um, you Borrow uh, is a way of getting books and other items from any Big Ten universities plus the Chicago, University of Chicago. The next one is Google Books. So Google Books seems to have fallen by the wayside. It's a little bit weird kind of getting access to it. But in the future, it actually will be much more active. And the university is taking part in the <coughs> Google project. So they're still scanning items. Um, it's just for the time being, it's not really something that's so helpful for us. Um, the Hockey Trust, which is based out of the University of Michigan, <coughs> Um, there are items if we digitize or we have a copy of it, then we can access that item. And then the SAMP Open Archive, as I mentioned before, which is based out of Chicago. Um, so SAMP op op Open Archives, this is a bunch of information, but basically we have gone through and decided which items we're interested in collecting. Um, you can go to the SAMP webpage and actually find more about it, and I'll explain. Yes? How does that decision process happen in terms of actual editions, where sometimes with, at least in Sanskrit texts, mm -hmm. a critical edition is done later, which has more errors than an earlier edition would have. And the only way I've ever found to find that out is just through word of mouth. Is there any mechanism to get more reliable editions? So we, we vote on it, um, but for the most part right now what SAMP is focusing on is um, uh, uh, periodicals. So it's not really looking at translations or editions of older texts yet. This is much more of trying to digitize items that are the most fragile. And with newsprint, that's, that's it. Newspapers and, and magazines are, are the first things to be destroyed because of the acidification process. Um, it's a very good question. Eventually, it will be something that we're going to have to take into consideration. Um, most of my colleagues, I must say, I'm very impressed, actually, with CONSUL. Um, most of them are very aware of South Asia in the sense that they have at least a master's degree, if not a PhD, in something to do with South Asian studies. So they know um, what they're doing. That's the best way to say it. Um, um, but yeah, 
as far as that is concerned, I think um, when they start getting to collections, they're just going through and, and scanning as many things as possible. So they will have, it's, they don't purchase them. I see. It's more on the idea that it is given to Sam, and so we are a library. And so from that legality standpoint, because University of Wisconsin is a member, and I think these are all the libraries, in that collection, since we are SAM, then everybody who is in there is that, that library. Well, how about just more generally, um, the process of sort of sorting through the good editions versus the ones that may be newer and maybe more widely dispersed, but have more errors? As, as far as, um, as General far physical books? Are yes. You so, um, that's a very good question. Um, it goes on many different levels. Um, there are, there's the um, prestige of the printing press itself. So we have automatic buying programs, so anything that comes from the University of Cambridge Press or something like that is going to be bought for the library. Um, as far as anything that's published in South Asia, um, the Library of Congress picks. We don't really have a choice, so we sign up for, we want complete literature let's just say, um, in Sanskrit. We don't choose what they pick, they choose what to give to us. If there is enough complaining about something, and trust me there is, they'll stop doing something or they'll look more into it. The workers um, at the Library um, of Congress in New Delhi and in Islamabad slash New Delhi, um, they're very, very keen on what they're looking for. So, does that answer your question? Yeah, very much so. Um, okay, so we have databases and pages, um, and I'm going to just go over. Let me check the time. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to go over now and show you. Um, here, there are coming projects and new databases, so, uh, Mitra, again, <laughs> shout out to you. I just uh, found she mentioned the Asiatic Society of Rumbai's database, which is really awesome, and we're going to be getting that very soon, especially because it's very reasonably priced. Word of mouth is very important, you guys. If you hear about anything, let me know. Um, but in addition to that, we just recently bought the East India Company Module 1 with the hopes of buying more. <laughs> and then um, there is a project that I'm starting to work on, and I don't know how far it's going to go, depending on funding, with uh, Professor... Uh, a part of our, our wide code, um, on trying to create a bibliography of theater performances in India that she used through her most recent book. So there are many things. There are things that we can purchase, and then there are things that we can work on. So if there's a bunch of information that you have from a project you're doing, come talk to me and we can figure out ways that we can synthesize that information so it'll be helpful for people in the future. That's why I'm mentioning the third one there. Um, and so we're going to go through demonstrations, and I'll do that. This is my information. Um, you can always just go to the library website, click on the, um, the uh, magnifying glass, and type in Todd. I'm the only Todd in the library. <laughs> I'm going to keep saying that until we hire another Todd. <laughs> So, um, I have two offices for now. Uh, I don't know about the Van Heist office in the future. I'm hoping to hold on to an office so I can hold office hours outside of the library, um, in the sense of librarian office hours. Um, but if, does anybody have a question for the time being before I move on and kind of show some stuff? Yes. So, when I was a uh, naive freshman, this ex professor at the university asked me to do a bunch of um, book scan for him because uh -huh. apparently we have a very extensive collection of um, books written in um, Bantu languages and he was studying when he was at a different university. So, he had me scan these books for hours and send them in, them in these PDFs because I was a student. Right. I'm wondering, is, you know, projects like that, this digitization or whatever, what fields is that spreading to? Like, you know, there are languages that have more importance now. Like, you know, maybe in your field it's Hindi or something like that. Okay. Do you take care to digitize or push the digitization of all languages that you encounter, or just ones that are important right now? 
So um, it, it's not me who pushes it. Um, first of all, I mean, I wish I had a say in, the, in it. Um, as the projects stand right now, it has to do with preservation issues. So the less represented um, languages tend to be the ones that we actually digitize more. Um, because um, if you look at, for example, India, um, the, uh, the paper quality is lower. And so um, we have to save the items or they're going to be gone. I mean, our goal, if you look at public libraries, they, their goal is to hold on to items um, until nobody wants them anymore. Our, I, our goal is to actually hold on to them for eternity. <laughs> so, you know, you see a lot of um, developing countries, um, a lot of underdeveloped countries, you know, traditionally, uh, third world, I don't really like that word, but those co countries don't have the quality of paper or they're impregnating paper to keep things from falling apart from bugs, but then eventually they get eaten away. So those are the ones that we're paying most attention to. If you look at the years, um, Eastern Europe, India, those items are from maybe the 60s. If they're from the West, from Western Europe, from the United States, those items are from the late 19th century. Because those were acidified as well. It's just we stopped doing it much earlier um, than, than they did elsewhere. Can I just follow up on that? Yeah. Um, presumably, if, if, the, if um, your professor didn't own the books and he was getting you to scan, there's a copyright issue there, right? There is, but there's all signs. We're not going to sue you, it's okay. <laughs> I, I, yeah. The, um, the signs say that this is what the law is, and that's so it. It's a third or something, right? That is not even established. Okay. It is so vague. <laughs> vague that, yes. We generally, the library in and of itself is um, a smaller section, so like a poem, if it's a book of poetry, a chapter, um, as long as there, it, it doesn't take up more than. So, and I think that's actually a fifth. So, yes. So, um, I'm interested in some original sources and the translation of them because I don't speak or read the language. Mm -hmm. So can you speak about what resources there are? I know there's Google Translate, and actually, interestingly enough, Google Books, sometimes the book gets translated in English. Mm -hmm. Um, which I think it must be more of the modern books, I don't know. Um, because the others are just actual scans, they're pictures. Right. So, um, I don't know, if you just can comment more about how to access translated, translations of That's books. a really good question. So, there are many things at play here. I, um, I personally do not think that it depends on what you need the yeah. translation for. Mm -hmm. um, if you are trying to just understand what's going on, a translation software like Google Translate or um, any of the other ones that are available can be helpful. Um, but, so for example, I cover Jewish studies. I don't actually read Hebrew. So what I do is I can read the alphabet, but I can't tell where the vowels are. So I will cut and paste the title of an item from Hebrew into Google Translate to understand the letter. It's not translate the title, but to understand what this is in Hebrew so I can check and see if we have the item. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as translating an entire text, we I wouldn't recommend that for scholarly pursuits. If it's a personal pursuit, you can certainly do what you like. Um, they're getting better and better by the day. Um, but there are big flaws. Yeah. Um, if you want to see if there is an English translation of a text you're looking for, that's when you contact me, okay. and I can order an English translation for you if it's available. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No problem. May I just quickly add to that, and and this is one of the reasons where 
acquiring languages becomes extremely important, mm -hmm. and especially if you're dealing with it in a scholarly context. I mean, that was a great question about editions and the errors that might exist you know, in different editions. Um, so just to get a gist of the text or a gist of a paragraph, a translation software might be helpful, but it actually creates more problems. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I'm saying this not just from the South Asia context, but um, I regularly teach a bridge course that connects our students, a bridge course in German, which is an upper level sort of reading class, but in German. And the messes that are created because of Google Translate yeah. is something yeah. that we sit around and laugh about. Yeah. I mean, that's the best way of telling students how wrong this is. Yeah. Because once they translate that English text back into German, um, they realize that this text was nothing. Um, this is nothing, you know, what they started with. Um, the other thing is, there are there is excellent work being done in translation and a very, very long tradition of translations from South Asian languages into English, but also South Asian languages into other South Asian languages, and our library has a very good collection of those as well. So, I mean, it's, it's just, you know, you just have to sort of sit down and play around with the titles um, until you actually get WordCat as a, as if you want a particular title or an author, but if you click on you only want it in German or you only want it in English, it will lead you to that source. If the source is not in the library, ILL, interlibrary loan, you borrow, or the librarian. So, is that okay? Even, even in terms of the way the library works, the library website highlights, correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. but I assume it's like the federal university library is it's linked through an authority record related to that author. That's correct. So you could, you will just be able to search that author and everything by that yeah. author in mm. any language will mm. come up. So it's like that would be a very easy way to mm -hmm. find that. And usually the translations, if I'm not wrong, are right next to the original on the shelf. So the phone number will be right there. And for that, I have highly actually recommend that you check out WorldCAD, which is this is the library web page, library.wis.edu, and it automatically owns, opens the catalog right here is WorldCat, and that will show you anything available, at least within those libraries. Now, with South Asia, not every single library is um, shown, but a lot of American libraries are shown, and so it gives you even more complete information as to, does this exist? Yeah. As opposed to, you know, and what you suggest is absolutely right and great, but also then looking through WorldCat will get you, you know, is there an English translation of book X. Is it even available? Does, it, does one library have it? Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask Paul to show his, his uh, the, you had some stuff to show yes. us, right? Because I know some of you have to leave. And then if we have time, we can come back to some more questions. So we'll, we hit the lights again. So I'm just going to do a brief overview, um, first of all. So I'm just going to be, um, <coughs> I'm going to look at Kali Dasa here. So in the ca catalog, I've opened that up. And then you have a bunch of different information here. And as far as that is showing you many different versions of the same item, um, you can go down and select the different languages mm. here. So for example, there is, um, and if you click more, that'll show you all of the different languages because only the top ones show. So we actually, for example, have uh, Urdu, we have five versions of the Kali Dasa in, in Urdu. So, you know, that didn't show up originally. So, it's important that you connect that. Um, in addition, you can also look for items that are online or not. So, if you're interested in looking at ebooks or you hate ebooks, you can pick one or the other. <laughs> it's entirely up to you. You can also look at where it's located. So, if you need something right away, then check uh, the different libraries. The Verona Shelving Unit, which is here, UW Shelving Facilities Remote, is actually in Verona, Wisconsin, and they will bring the item to you, but it's just a question of the fact that we really don't have space in our libraries to cover everything that we own. Mm -hmm. um, in addition, you can look at different formats, different media, um, subjects, and uh, then there is also, Sometimes, I guess here there isn't, you can also change the date. 
So you can look at for an, uh, mm -hmm. a certain edition if there was something that was discovered about a text after a certain point, then you can look at all the different versions that came out after that point. So, for example, if a new um, uh, if, if a new uh, text was discovered after 2015, you can see after 2015 which items would include that new text or at least reference to it. Um, okay, so then we're going to go to databases. Um, <coughs> So going to databases, you just click down on the catalog. For really quick, I'm just going to show WorldCat. It's a different interface. It automatically comes up. And this is where you would put in. So Kali, uh, um, I just want to make sure that you guys are aware of this. Um, and then. There's the years. Huh? The years are on this. Yeah, the years are on this one. So you can check, check the years, the languages. Um, so you could go through. Um, you can also select the different items. Um, this includes more than just books. So there are other items like articles. Now let's go to the uh, databases really quickly. So on databases, you can actually br browse by subject. It's a little bit hard to see, but it's just browse by subject slash type. So we, as South Asianists, are put together with Southeast Asia, partially because um, some of the databases are actually connected, and rather than just duplicate everything. But we're on top, too, so that's pretty awesome there, <laughs> at the very bottom. Um, so <laughs> there's core, also helpful, history, South Asia, and then Southeast Asia. And um, so, the one that I wanted to show you first, so there's a Center for Research Libraries, and you can click that view online. So this is a Center for Research Libraries, which is basically what you borrow also works through. So you can get a lot of information uh, digitally through there. Um, it's not the same thing as SAM, but it is run with SAM. In addition to that, um, there is... East India Company Module 1. So this is what I was talking about, the thing that I just recently purchased. And it's Governance and Empire. So it's basically a bunch of items from England on South Asia. But it gives a lot of information, and so that's why I selected to buy it. Um, you can actually get right here, not sure where to start. I highly recommend that you take a tour so you can look through and find out what's available. Um, this is through Adam Matthew, which is a British-based company. Um, and then you can go in and look at the different scopes, and then you can start um, checking things out. One of the things that I really like about this is that there's data visualization. So you can view maps, and you can look at different things like tea, textiles, um, different kind of materials, um, there are tons of different things that you can look at as far as that's con concerned, but I'm really into digital humanities and I think it's really cool when you can actually mm. map things on a chart. Mm. Um, iron production, for example, or lead production, you know, just kind of cool. Um, any questions about East India Company? All right, let me go then on back. Um, there's another way that you can get to databases. So, for example, if you want to go to ATLA, which is a religious studies database, you can just type the name in, and it'll come up. ATLA Religious Database with ATLA Serials. View online. And then you can put it in. It's offered through EBSCOhost. You'll see that there are only a few numbers of companies now that actually produce these databases. Unfortunately, they don't always work together. Um, so we do have, um, with the library web page, there is also um, the articles tab, which if you're looking for articles for any class, including this, you can go and look in there. But the problem with that is it's not searching all of the databases, and it also cuts off after a certain time. So if the database is going slow, you might not get all of the results. 
So it's nice when you first start out, but you might also want to go and look at the different databases, including like JSTOR. Um, So then, newspapers are also very important. We're going to look. Oops. Uh, databases, styles by subject, and South Asia. There are a number of newspaper databases. Um, there is. Oh, another one that's really cool is India Raj and Empire. Um, to look at the newspapers are here, South Asian newspapers, 1864 to 1922. So if you're inter interested in anything before um, independence up to a certain point, I mean, 22 to 47. Do you um, have any Sri Lankan sources, or is it all mostly India? So we can look. <laughs> I would be more gassed. Yeah. <laughs> it's a Sri Lanka. Jewish features, titles, published in yep, India, right. Yeah, so we've got, yeah, Indian accents, Sri Lanka, and languages including English and Gujarati. Okay, so, yeah, perfect. Um, there are some other ones, too. Um, the Digital South Asia Library does have newspapers in it as well. Um, and then there's also ProQuest Historical Newspapers, Time in India, 1830 to 2007. So that's really covering a long amount of time. So if you're trying to get the um, the kind of reaction of uh, at least uh, the times of India mm -hmm. from 1838 to 2007 on a particular subject, that's a great place to go. Um, like after independence, because a lot of these things are actually prior to independence. All right. Now I did want to show. This is what the. Asi uh, Asiatic Society of Mumbai looks like, wow. their page, and as soon as I get this set up, I have to fill out a form and then they have to sign the agreements, so I make no promises.